right, everybody. So my name is Jay English, and I want to welcome you to the Cross Cultural Coach video cast. And I'm really excited about this opportunity to sit with a great friend of mine. Um, this man, his name is Daniel Harris, better known as DH, uh, yeah, founder yeah, yeah. of DH Music. Yes, Just sir. dropped an incredible album. You need to go <laughs> check that out. The process continues. You can even go pick up the other one, which was the process. Trust the process. Yes, sir. Just look up his name. Just pick up all his albums. Let's <laughs> 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 go pick them all up. But I really wanted to have this conversation <clears throat> around incarceration. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm going to allow him to, to tell a bit more about that. But I think there's such a misconception, especially right now, when crazy stuff is happening. And in my mind, even when injustices are done, there's a group of people that are looking at the background of people or looking at their record or looking at where they came from or who they used to be <laughs> or whatever. And mm -hmm. they're saying that people are deserving. Hey, you know, if well, he had a record, so he deserved or, you know, hey, look, he had it coming or this or that. And I feel like we're missing the humanity part of life. We're missing the part of just because something I used to do or something I used to be a part of shouldn't dictate who I am today. Yeah. Yeah. And my man, truly blessed Daniel to have you here. Um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we've done a lot of work together, <laughs> uh, a little bit of everything all around Milwaukee. This brother, mm -hmm. I, man, I, I used to call him Milwaukee famous, but it ain't even Milwaukee famous no more. Like, <laughs> literally nationwide now. This brother's getting international streams, and it's, Crazy, God is really doing some incredible things. So, Daniel, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're into right now. Uh, my name is Daniel Harris. I'm an uh, inspirational gospel rap artist uh, based out of Milwaukee, but currently um, things have been moving at a pace that I can only give my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ credit for. Uh, the momentum has been great. Uh, myself and my band of brothers, I have a band that I travel with as well. Um, DH and the Next Level Band, Bruce, Mike, and Chris. And we've been able to travel around the country um, just doing what we love to do, you know, sharing the gospel in a very unorthodox way uh, with as many people as we possibly can. Um, and I also do my own solo studio projects that are um, being accepted, that are being accepted in a lot of different markets. And it's, it's been a blessing. I'm also the owner of Out Here Serving Clothing Line. I am a, a number one book selling author, a 31 day devotional for doers, movers and shakers, as well as um, Chronicles of a Good Man, which are available on Amazon as well. Um, come on, come through with yeah. the plug. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I try to, you know, keep it right here just in case somebody wants to. But, um, and then also I've, I've been uh, blessed to be able to serve as, um, as a community uh, advocate, I guess, in the way of being involved in various community initiatives, giving back to the homeless, having clothing drives. Uh, we've also had international um, initiatives such as Care for Kenya, where we help to build uh, churches and medical facilities, specifically in the village of Matu in Kenya, Africa. And so, um, yeah, man, it's been a blessing to be able to do this independently uh, on my own terms uh, for the glory of God and for the edification and the advancement of the kingdom of God. man. So, And that is amazing. That's amazing. Well, I want to jump into this conversation because I'm excited about it. You know, I know a bit about your story, but I think mm -hmm. there's so many people that this <clears throat> help. Mm -hmm. Brothers who may be going through this to see mm -hmm. the other side for people that don't even understand this and don't even know about it to hear. Yeah. Um, but this whole premise of this video cast is life after incarceration. Yes. So, you know, I'm not trying to put you out there or nothing, but uh, you did do hey, a little it's bit out of time. You, you it's it's out there. It's out there. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, man. It is what it is. You know, so now, let's talk I, I about know it. who you are today, but tell us, yeah. tell us a little bit about who you used to be that got you in trouble. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Let me uh, say this before we get into that. This is a testimony. Okay, <laughs> this is <laughs> he is not still doing this, <laughs> right? Hello, yeah. I don't. <laughs> I just want to make sure we're beyond the statutes of limitations. Say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I actually um, 
contrary to what most people may think, I, I grew up on the north side of Milwaukee, born and raised. Um, I grew up in a house with a father and a mother, which was very un unlikely in the area and in the environment that I'm I'm from. Most of the times you have single parent homes, but I grew up with both of my parents. Um, and uh, even though the situation wasn't perfect, it was definitely a leg up compared to some of my friends who I grew up in my environment with. Um, <clears throat> my father, uh, was from the street, but, you know, changed his life and began to, uh, work legitimately becoming a, a driver for, uh, people with medical conditions. And my mother was in the healthcare field. She worked at Sacred Heart, but my mother was also a teacher. She was a Sunday school teacher. My mother was so well versed with the Bible that she was, um, a person who would teach pastors how to rightly divide the word of truth. Wow. So um, I grew up not just going to church, but I grew up really in Christ because that was an example that was uh, shown in my household by my mother, not necessarily my father. My father gave me a lot of street smarts and a lot of practical principles that I can use in life in general. You know, uh, he was very well respected for the things that he had done prior to changing his life and who he was. My pops was more like the muscle in his group of uh, cons constituents. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good word for it. <laughs> yeah, I tried to throw that in there. Yeah. Uh, but growing up, man, I felt like I felt very uh, alone a lot of times. I'm the youngest of four. And... um I felt very alone. I felt like, you know, I needed to prove myself. I had to prove my worth. A lot of times I didn't feel like my voice was heard because when you're the youngest in the family, typically, at least in my situation, um, you kind of feel like you're supposed to be seen and not heard. Right. And so uh, I wanted that same respect that I saw that my father would have from people when he would show up. Because by the time I was born, he was uh, not active in the things that he was known for doing by the time I was born. But yeah. when he would show up on the scene and I would be with him, like it was such a level of respect and honor that people would show him, uh, sometimes opening this door for him or, you know, just the way they saluted him. Like you knew that he was a man of honor amongst his friends, you know? And so, um, I really kind of wanted that for myself. And I didn't know how to go about doing that. But, you know, when you're younger and you become a teenager, you get to smelling yourself a little bit, like my mom would say. Yeah. Um, you start making rash decisions. I began to make rash decisions. The first time that I left home, I was about 14 years old. That was the first time I left home. And uh, I was gone for an extended period of time. And I knew really nothing about the streets at that time. Um <clears throat> I wound up living in an abandoned house initially because I had nowhere to go. I didn't have any connections in the streets. I didn't have any friends that were, you know, uh, that actually knew what I was going through. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I wound up out there is because me and my father were getting into it. We was getting into it a lot. We were getting into it a lot. So I said, you know what, forget this, forget school. I dropped out of high school. Uh, and um, what was that? That was my going into my sophomore year. And I remember one day uh, coming out of an, an abandoned house and one of the the gentlemen that was considered like an OG in my neighborhood saw me coming out of the abandoned house. He's like, what are you doing in there? I'm like, yeah, you know, just in there serving a fiend or whatever, you know. Right. And long story short, man, he saw me coming out of that house again. And he was like, are you living in there? I'm like, yeah, that's where I'm living at, man. And he was like, no, come on, you coming with me. Not realizing that he was connected to um, a certain group of people in Milwaukee that were very much revered. Uh, I didn't know who he was, but um, he was definitely a, a well-known and well-respected figure in, in the streets. And he became like a big brother to me. And long story short, man, um, by the age of 15, I had committed some crimes, uh, armed robberies, uh, that landed me in a position where I was on, um, and this is all documented. I was on Milwaukee's most wanted list for armed robbery, 
gang affiliation and gun possession uh, by the time I was 16. Wow. Um, from the age of 16 to 18 years old, I stayed on uh, on the run from the Milwaukee Police Department. And when I turned 18, uh, they found me on April 17th, 2003. And I was sentenced to four years, um, mandatory four years uh, with no potential of good behavior time uh, on April 17, 2003. And that was my first case that I had ever caught. Um, not saying I wasn't getting into other stuff prior to that, but that was the first thing I got convicted for. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was different because in my situation, the way that the Milwaukee Police Department found me was because of somebody that was in my circle that wound up um, getting caught on separate um accounts for other crimes yeah. and and began to turn state's evidence on all of the people that was closest to him to reduce his time and so um when you talk about you know informants and all of that stuff that stuff is real man yeah. and a lot of times you know it is usually the people that are the closest to you that will cause you uh, the most pain, but also at the same time, if I would not have been doing the things that I was doing, I would not have found myself in that situation, you know? So there is a sense of personal responsibility that has to be taken when you're dealing with um, situations like that. And I want, I want to interject something here, uh, Pastor Jay. Uh, there's a term that we have to kind of do away with that, prevents us from taking personal responsibility for our actions. And that is, well, the white man did it or the white man did it. Let me tell you something. I'm from the north side of Milwaukee. When I was robbing people, it was not one white person with me. Yeah. You hear me? It wasn't one white person with me, man. It wasn't. I. It, it was certain decisions. Yes, the system itself is corrupt. And it was created by people of other ethnicities in order to continue to keep us down as a people. But ultimately, it was my decision. It's going back to decision making, personal decision making and personal conviction convictions that caused me to say, you know what? I'm not going to go this path and follow God. I'm not going to go this path. And because I always knew I was talented. I always knew that I was going to be a musician from the time of four years old. I, I always knew that always always but i didn't follow that i followed something different and uh i don't know who believes what but i believe in the word of god and the word of god says a certain way of living seems right to a man but in the end it leads to death a death is a separation a separation of your identity a separation of um of your calling a separation of your destiny your purpose you know what i'm saying and i'm just grateful that i'm in a position where i was able to revert back to that because a lot of my friends that I came up with, man, they can't say that they had the same opportunity to go back to that. But um, I just wanted to throw that in there. And so I got sentenced to four years in prison. And during that time, man, while I was locked up, uh, I'll say this. The, I got into an altercation while I was in the House of Correction in Franklin, Wisconsin. Early on, I hadn't have been I couldn't have been in the House of Correction no more than maybe about three months. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in my dorm, you know, just minding my business. I'm not talking to nobody. Nobody talking to me. Hey, bro, I'm it, mentally, I'm somewhere else. I'm physically here, but mentally somewhere else. I checked out and this guy, he's talking real crazy to me. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> with the way you talking to me. Yeah. Now, anybody that knows me knows I've never been the person to initiate conflict. In fact, my friends on the street that I used to connect with would always call me the voice of reason amongst animals. Okay, <laughs> like, okay, I get it. We got to go do X, Y, Z, but let's think about this for a minute, okay? I've always been the voice of reason. Now, if you come to me with something, then, of course, I'm going to have to handle that accordingly just because that's the nature of what I was involved with. Yeah. But this particular gentleman, when when he began to talk crazy to me, um, Pastor Jay, to this day, I feel so bad for how I responded to him. I tried to beat the brakes off that boy. Because in that situation, in that situation, in that environment, either 
either you are at the table or you food. There's no, there's no in between. So you have to kind of make an example out of people so they know leave dude alone. You probably want to leave him alone. And so after that, I did not have too many other altercations during those four years because that word travels with you, whatever camp you go with. Like, no, nah, cuz solid, cuz cool. Like, he cool, man. Like, I, I like him. I like how he move around here, you know, just leave him alone. But long story short, uh, it was a very dark place. I wound up going to solitary confinement after that. I wound up going to solitary confinement shortly after that. What was, was that like for you? Yo. Being in solitary confinement? Because yeah, people talk about solitary. Um, oh, man. Obviously, it studies out and everything else about the effects of being alone, by, like for real, for real alone by yeah. yourself. What was that like for you? Man, the best way that I can describe it, Pastor Jay, it was hell without flames, man. Wow. For real. I was in a cell 23 hours a day. 23 hours a day, man. Um, to the point where they would roll like a, a portable shower to your cell. Like, you yeah. know, and that was the only time you would really get out of your cell. And so um, you hearing grown men screaming and crying and calling for their mothers because mentally, if you're not stable, It'll drive you crazy, literally, literally drive you crazy, man. Um, and it was the one of the worst experiences I've ever been in. You know, they feed you through a, like a dog, doggy trap. Yeah. Like your tray comes in. There's no contact with anybody. The only people you talk to are the people that are beside you in other cells. And you can't see them unless you like have a mirror or something like that. But like it's the craziest experience man but it was one of the best it was the worst of times i believe it was the writer charles dickens that said it was the worst of times and the best of times worst of times because of the experience but the best of times because had i not been in solitary confinement i would not have had a chance to stop and really think about what i was doing yeah i was moving so fast in the street like doing things without taking into consideration the consequences and it drove me to really dig deep and look at myself and say, is this, is this the life that I want to live? Is this how I want to continue to live? Is this, is this how I want to my, my life to end? Cause if I don't stop, there's only two places for me to go. You're going to go to jail or you're going to wind up getting killed out in the streets in Milwaukee. If you're playing that game. Yeah. So I already experienced one. I knew the other one was right around the corner if I kept doing the same thing. So I said, you know what? I need to change. I need to change. And I, I need to change to a degree where I don't care what other people think about the changes that I'm going to make. Because guess what? Ain't nobody in this cell with me. <laughs> <laughs> nobody there but you. Ain't nobody there but me and God, man. And so... While I was in there, two things happened. I became very well read. I read the Bible, um, I think it was three times cover to cover while I was in there. I read it three times cover to cover. And then also what I began to do was I began to read the Merriam Webster's dictionary. And what that did for me was every day, a word that I didn't know, I would try to memorize it and then incorporate it into sentence structure. So that way it can expand my vocabulary. Those were those were two things that I did. But then also, the more I was in there and the more you would hear people like screaming out of like anguish, man, like it was doing something to me spiritually. And I'm like, God, listen, I've seen my mother walk after you, follow you for many years. I've seen my, my grandmother believe in you. You know, I've gone to church, but I don't have a personal relationship with you, yep. you know, like. And I know that. And I know that if, if I don't do this, the end is going to be death in the most dramatic way I can possibly think of. So this is what I'm going to do. This, this is the conversation I had with God. I said, man, if you help me to change my life, all of these gifts that you've given me, all of these talents and all of those things, because I always was known for rapping. I used to battle rap in projects like Highland Projects, you know, um, in my section, rapping on the corners on Cherry Street and Valete and 
you know, rapping in school, beating on the desk, getting kicked out of school for that. So I already always knew that that gift was there. Yes. I went to Milwaukee High School of the Arts for jazz composition. I played bass guitar as well. Some of the best musicians you ever can think of came out of that school in this area. You know what I mean? And so I always knew those gifts was there. So I told God while I was in that situation, I said, you know, if you give me a chance to really turn my life around and show me what it really mean to walk with you, I can't promise you that I'm going to be perfect, but I can't promise you that I'm going to be progressing. You know, so, yes. yep. you know, you give me a chance to really live life in a different way. I'll always tell people that it was you that changed my life. You know what I'm saying? And that was a vow that I made to God while I was in solitary confinement in 2003. And uh, I've been trying to keep that promise ever since, man. Brother, you hit up. So there's a couple of things you said that I definitely want to spend a couple minutes on. So uh, a few minutes back, you were talking about the reality that these were decisions that you made. Yes, sir. Even in that cell, looking around and realizing I'm in here by myself. So if yeah. something change is going to be made, it's got to be made with me. Yes, sir. Uh, and it's so crazy. What you said has so much truth in it. So mm -hmm. I'm out here having these conversations with some of everybody. And I tell people like, I have two very different conversations um, for, for a lot of people who don't understand what you're talking about. Don't come from that lifestyle. Don't get it. Yeah. I'm explaining to them the system, what systemic mm -hmm. racism is, how that works, how we've gotten here, the history of things that keep, as you said, which is true, keep perpetuating this cycle that keeps yes, specific groups of people from achieving a certain level of success consistently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know that's true. But on the flip side, even as I explain systemic racism, specifically to my young African-American men, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm working with youth, when I'm working with young adults, whatever, and I'm explaining to them, OK, yes, I get it. There's a system. Yes, I understand. It's not fair. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you still get to make choices. You have a choice. Yeah. You still get to make choices. And your mm -hmm. choices may not be the choices you want to make. They may yeah. be harder than for somebody else who's in a better situation or yeah. was born in a different city or was born literally with a different skin color who doesn't have to make the decisions that you may have to make. Yeah. That does not take the power away from you that you ultimately looking around. Yeah. Got to make the choices of what your life is going to look like. Absolutely. And, you know, the word also says, you know, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I understood as a child, I reasoned as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Right. One of those childish things is putting the blame for your actions on somebody else. Yes. Because if you keep doing that, then there will be no growth. There will be no maturing process. There will be uh, no opportunity for you to live out the greatness that was instilled within you when you were created by the father. And so if, if we're continuing to think like children, how can we ever be the men that we were called to be? I knew that I had to put certain mindsets and certain, you know, uh, um, ways of handling myself. I had to put that behind me in order to become the person that I'm still progressing into, that I'm still growing into. But, you know, I'm not where I once was, you know, and I thank God for where I am now. But there was a process that had to happen in order for, you know, the person that I am now to come into fruition, man. And taking responsibility was a big part of that, you know, also becoming remorseful for the things that I was doing. It's one thing for you to do something to be like, Oh yeah, I shouldn't have did that. But deep in your heart, if you don't have a sense of like repentance and like, you know what, man, I was so out of pocket. I wasn't raised like that. You know, yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't even in a household where things like that were going on. Where did this come from? It came from a sense of selfishness. It came from a sense of, um, lusting for things rather than working for things, you know, becoming envious of a certain lifestyle, not understanding that there are certain things that happen. Yeah. That I, I always use this analogy. There's always two heads to every coin. And a lot of times people want to show you one side of it, but the other side is something dangerous that most people don't even talk about. Yeah. It's cool. You can have a car with the rims and loud system and all of that. But they, what they don't show you is if you stop at the wrong stoplight in Milwaukee on, in my section, you're going to get robbed, bro. And there's no, there's no guarantee that your life won't be taken for something 
that you are out here shining and flashing in. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's it's good. It, you know, it, it's good for a while. That money is fast. That money come real fast. But you know what? I lost a very dear friend of mine at the age of 16. Uh, he died in my arms, Pastor Jay. He died in my arms. The last thing he told me was, man, don't let me die like this over something very stupid, over something that could have been avoided if we would not have been walking in pride. You know what I'm saying? If we would have been moving differently and making a different set of decisions. You know what I'm saying? So like you were saying, you know, um, when you talk to young people, it's really your choice. Everything goes back to you taking personal responsibility for your uh, decisions and the actions behind those decisions, man. So, yeah, absolutely. Because I think there's you you hear the 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 stereotypical thing that's being said, specifically about African Americans of mm -hmm. being victims. You know, they have a victim mentality. Yeah. I've heard that mm -hmm. a number of times, and I'm like, yeah, I, I don't agree with the victim mentality. I think there is there are some individual people who do. Mm -hmm. And what I try to really reach them and tell them is just because you've been victimized and there have been people who believe me have been victimized. Absolutely. Sexually Absolutely. Been abandoned by friends or family. They've been, yes, sir. they've been mistreated. There's been injustices cast upon them or things that they've just gone through in life that you would not wish on anybody. But yeah. even if you have been victimized, mm -hmm. you do not have to mentally stay a victim. No, you don't. We get to make the choice. And then some of them who become angry, going back to the scripture that says, man, that the anger of man doesn't bring about God's righteousness. Hello. You know what I'm saying? That yes, there's sir. nothing good that comes out of that, which is why it tells us be angry. And saying not. God know we're gonna get mad at some stuff, but you're like, hey, you better be careful. <laughs> better pump them brakes <laughs> yes sir with the hurry upness for real <laughs> yeah so you talked to us a little bit about you know how you got in and about what that experience was for you yeah uh, my thing is knowing who you are today and man mm -hmm. i rock with you hard uh same I, here a thousand percent you uh, already know i go to bat for you in a heartbeat uh um, same here one of my brothers and the yeah. thing God is doing through you, the things that he's doing for you, the doors he's opening, the people that man, you're reaching. All praise to God, God, man. And ministering to, the yeah. life you live right now looks so completely different than the life you used to live. Completely different, man. But what are some of the struggles that mm -hmm. you can explain to people that may not know? Like, man, look, I, I, I did my time. I came mm -hmm. out. I've changed my life. But here's what's still happening to me on the other side of this. Well, uh, one of the things that happened to me was uh, when I got sentenced, when I got sentenced, the judge told me, he said, uh, I'm giving you an extended period of time on uh, extended supervision because of the nature of your case and because of the connections to the people that you had on your case, because these are not uh, uh, normal citizens of society. Yeah. All right. Yeah. These are like predicate felons. You know what I mean? And um, so I'm giving you four years in and we're giving you X amount of time. It was more than a decade on extended supervision. Oh, wow. More than a decade. And so um, I did my time. I came home in 2007. First of all, I never went back. It's 2020. I never went back. I never got revocated. Never. Not once. Never dropped dirty. Never had no police contact. But one thing that always bothered me was if you knew that I'm from this area, right, and you want me to become a successful citizen in society, why would you intentionally put me back in the environment that's drug ridden, that is gang affiliated? You know this, you know where I'm from. Like, why would you put me back in that environment if you really want me to succeed? Why not put me in a place where I can be completely detached from that? No. And then I can focus on building a new life. That's not what they did. They put me back in the same community um, where I had learned so many survival traits in, in hopes that I would fail intentionally. Wow. And so when I went and had that first, mm, maybe like the second or third meeting with my uh, probation officer, she told me something. She was a Caucasian lady, older Caucasian lady. I had been out for about a month 
And she told me to my face, Pastor Jay, she said, you know, we weren't expecting you to be out 30 days. <laughs> oh, wow. I yeah, said, thank I you so much for the vote of confidence. I appreciate all the support, the love, and all that. <laughs> I like, oh, wow. you weren't expecting me to be out for 30 days. And I looked at her, I looked at her dad in her eyes. I said, watch what I'm finna do though. I'm yeah. finna show you something you ain't never seen before in your life. She said, What's that? I said, I'm finna do exactly what you told me to do. Stay out of trouble, go get a job. And that's exactly what I did, man. I never went back to prison. And you know, it was hard for me because I had to go back and live with my parents. You're talking about like me being on my own since I was, you know, off and on, off and on being on my own since I was 14. And I was in my 20s at the time yeah. and I had to go and live with my parents. And that was a very humbling thing for me because I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be here. But, you know, I needed to be there. And I'm grateful that I was there because so many of my friends uh, that came home from being incarcerated did not have a support system. So they wound up getting entangled with many of the activities that led them back to um, that led them to prison to begin with. Right. And so I want to address that as well. People can look at individuals and say, oh man, you know, they going back to prison. They getting back involved in the things that got them in trouble, but you don't know what their support system is like. Right. You know what I'm saying? You don't, I knew a guy personally that had done 20 years. He was about maybe two weeks. This was when I was in RCI. He was maybe about two weeks away from going home. They put a new guy in his cell. When I tell you he beat him to the point where it was blood all over the cell because he didn't want to come home. Everybody that that he knew and loved that was actually in his corner, they had passed away during the 20 years while he was incarcerated. Wow. So for him, it was like, I don't have nowhere to go. So I'm finna catch this new case and I'm gonna stay right here. Cause he was afraid to come back into society. So I'm saying like, there needs to be real programming, not people actually taking advantage of the state funding that they're given because, you know, they have access to this money and they are gonna make it look like they're doing something and they're not, not helping people at all. No, there needs to be real funding, real programming that helps people to get reinserted back into society successfully. That's one thing. The other thing that was very difficult for me was finding gainful employment. Man, Pastor Jay, I had one experience, and I'm a, I'm not going to say the name of the company. If I said the name of the company, you would everybody would know who it was. I go there. I have my resume. I went to resume building classes. I learned how to do cover letters, all of this stuff that I ain't never had to do robbing people. You know, I, you know, I need 5000 I'm just going to make this move right, you know, right quick. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, bro, I don't need no for a new type of employment. <laughs> Hello, legal. Hello, I, I need it all legit now. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, I went there. I had a suit. I had, you know, I was dressed. I had everything I needed. I walked in there looking for employment and it was a caucasian lady that saw me come in and she said oh well you look very nice well thank you you know i try to hold it together yeah and <laughs> i go in there man and i'm talking to her she said uh okay go ahead fill out the application and i'm going to come sit with you and talk to you a little bit okay fill out the application gave all the correct information then i had to get to the point where i marked off have you ever been convicted of a felony? A mark, yes. I didn't want to mark no, because you're going to find out eventually. You're going to have to run my information anyway, so I might as well tell you up front and be honest about it and tell you what happened. You know, I put on there, hey, I went, I got in trouble. I'm very remorseful for it. You know, I got my high school diploma while I was in there. I uh, got college credits for psychology while I was in there. I became a tutor to other brothers that couldn't read that well. I became a tutor through the library system there. Everything, you know, I'm telling them all things I accomplished, the different certifications that I got while I was in there from OSHA, from all of this. And she looked at it. She saw that mark. And she balled up my uh, my application in front of my face and said, we're not hiring. Wow. That's what I experienced personally. Yeah. And it took everything in my power, man, for me not to break down in tears in front of her, man. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, these people ain't going to break me, man. I'm going to break them before they break me. Yeah. For real. But that was a very, that was like low moments, you know, um, Going to McDonald's and looking for a job and them telling me that I was overqualified for the job. Like and I had no job history. Yeah. And that that was 
a Caucasian person that was telling me that, you know, like, no, nah, you don't want to work here. You know, you have way too many qualifications. I don't have any qualifications. That's the point. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. while I'm here, you know, um, I'm like, man, I'll clean toilets. I'll do whatever, man. I'm just trying to do whatever I can not to go back to that. Right. And um, at the time I was in the church, um, I was at a church called Faith Builders International Ministries. And the pastor said something over a pulpit one day in his sermon. He said, listen, I know there are people in this church that are looking for gainful employment. And God told me to make looking for a job your job until you get a job. So that's what I did. Every day, man, I was putting in resumes. Every day I was trying to find employment, hitting up every site, workshops, all type of stuff. And the first job that I got was through a brother by the name of Hispanic brother, man, by the name of Eric Torres. He's a friend of mine to this day. He supports my music to this day, man. Eric Torres gave me my first job when I came out from prison, man. Uh, I worked for Labor Ready uh, Staffing Services, man, for him and a lady named Mary Sanchez. They always made sure I, uh, I had some kind of job. It was some of the worst jobs I ever had. I was getting paid like seven, eight dollars an hour, but I had to do what I had to do. Right. And so I knew that I wanted to become a forklift driver. So I took dead end jobs intentionally just to get my my job qualifications up so that way I could have gainful employment that will pay me the most for my experiences. And so, um, man, it was hard, man. It was hard. There were many days where I'm like, you know what, man? I need to go rob somebody. I'm be honest. I'm just <laughs> I'm like, dog, I need to pick up a sack or something. This ain't working. I'm barely feeding myself. I'm barely contributing to my family at that point. Like, as a man that does something to you, when we are built to provide and you're not able to do that, like that does something to your that does something to your your character. But what I can say is that I've had great people encouraging me along the way. I've had a lot of friends, even, um, you know, uh, young ladies that I was courting or dating at the time. They knew my situation. They were very helpful. Um, had friends, you know, uh, people in church that are always praying for me and encouraging me. And without that core system, man, I would have, I would have been back in the streets. No doubt. No doubt, man. So, and the music was a big part of that too. Yeah. Uh, the music kept me focused. It kept me writing all the time. And one of the first people that helped me to record and didn't make me pay no studio time or nothing was the elder gentleman by the name of Melvin Santiago, Pastor Melvin Santiago from Faith Builders International Ministries, Puerto Rican older gentleman that really became like a father figure to me. And he never charged me for studio time. He said, as long as you're doing this for God, you're welcome in my house. You can come and record, you know, and that music, when I tell you the music was terrible, Oh, it was horrible. Oh, it was, and he said, oh, Daniel, this is great. Keep going, man. You're doing a great job. I listen to that stuff now, man. I'm like, he was lying. He was an honest person, you know, but he was lying to me. But he was really encouraging me to stay focused. And he's like, the more you do it, the better it's going to get. Keep going. I, I had people, you know, in my circle that knew my story. They was just pushing me and encouraging me. And so I want to encourage anybody that may have, uh, family members that are incarcerated or have family members that are being reinserted into society at this time, man, don't give up on them. God didn't give up on you. Don't give up on them, man, because you just don't know where they are mentally. It's it's heartbreaking, man, to go through stuff like that when you know you're trying. You're trying your best, man, and people are still not really giving you a real chance to to make right of your wrongs. You know what I'm saying? Don't give up on them because God didn't give up on you, man. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's that's what I wanted to hear more about. So, man, I appreciate you and your honesty. You're always transparent with me, so I'm, I wasn't even worried about Absolutely. that part. I can't believe we got it caught on camera. This is hey, look. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it needs to be to help some people see that. Absolutely. Uh, before Absolutely. I let you go, I want to ask you this for, you talked about everything of coming out and, you know, from employment, finding places to live, Mm -hmm. All these different things that go on for people that are coming out of incarceration, trying to restart mm -hmm. their lives. Mm -hmm. What are things that people who may view this or may listen to this, what are what would you want them to know? How could somebody potentially help mm -hmm. now that they know that these are some of the struggles people may face? 
if you see somebody and they are trying, it's two different types of people, right? And I'm going to say this very quickly. When you see them coming out of prison, it's two different types of people. One person feels like everything should be given to them. Everything should be, no, it, it, that's not life. No matter what situation you're in, things are not just always given to you. You're going to have to work for it. A lot of times people miss blessings because it comes wrapped in work. No, you're going to have to work. You know, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So if a person is trying to take advantage of the system, you know, you just kind of encourage them to keep going. But if you see somebody that is actually trying, man, help them, send them, you know, job references, send them workshops. If you know about, um, you know, when they have uh, job fairs, send them that information, you know, pray with them. Take them out to eat, talk to them, because just that your presence could be a blessing to them. Something as, as simple as inviting them to dinner or asking them what do they need. Now, don't use wisdom. You Use wisdom now because you don't want people to take advantage of you. Right. But if you see somebody really, really trying, give them that helping hand. And my last words is, you know, regardless of where we are in life, um, never look down on another man unless you're reaching down to pick him up. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, Daniel, I want to say thank you. Thank you thank for your you, time, bro. man. I am so happy for you. I'm proud of you. I I'm am proud like, of you, man. Bro, I'm loving this journey that we're on and seeing the crazy stuff uh, that's happening. Yes. You know, just the doors that are opening. Yes, sir. I'm going to pray God continues to bless you and continue Same to open here. them doors. Continue Same to get here. This brother just recently dropped this album, and in the first week, you had a quarter of a million streams. Hello. Hello. <laughs> the process continues, man. So, man, Daniel. Hey, and shout out to Pastor Jay for the great job. Shout out to Pastor Jay of Plain English, and shout out to Bruce Furlow of Joyful Noise Music for doing the engineering and the mastering to give it a professional and polished sound. People are always saying, you know, they enjoy my music, but if you don't have that component, the music is going to sound as great. So thank you, Pastor Jay, for uh, contributing to the project that made it a success. So I really appreciate you, my brother. Absolutely. Well, man, I'm, I'm going to let you go because I know you got about 50 other things to do. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to get right back online. I got another <laughs> uh, got another interview right after this. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, I love you. I'm praying right, for you. you and thank you again. Thank you so much.